Thanks for that flattering introduction. First, a bit about my company, Frio Geos. Frio Geos is a loose association of experienced geophysicists and geologists based in Fremantle, Western Australia. We provide assistance in all aspects of exploration, including seismic interpretation, training, depth conversion, and prospect evaluation. Today I'm going to explain spectral decomposition and how it can be used quantitatively by interpreters, not from a mathematical viewpoint. There's some maths, but not a lot, as I intend to focus on how we can use the spectral attributes. This presentation is based on a number of articles I've written for the ASEG magazine preview. Open Detect software has been used for most of the displays in this talk. Here is an outline of the presentation. I will explain spectral decomposition and how it works, discuss different transform methods, and then go into how we can derive estimates of thickness of beds, and then I will follow with two examples and wrap it up. It should take 20 minutes and I'll be happy to answer some questions. So what is spectral decomposition? Spectral decomposition essentially separates out desired frequency components from a wide bandwidth seismic data set. As a result, we generate several cubes of data from the initial amplitude volume, one for each frequency. Each frequency component conveys slightly different insights into the geology of an area. We don't have to calculate every frequency or use the whole volume. It is only necessary to calculate over an area of interest or selected frequencies. Spectral decomposition has uses in reconnaissance exploration, thickness calculating, volume estimation and reservoir studies. I will cover these in detail later in the presentation, but here is a summary put together by the EAGE. From left to right, the spectral decomposition horizon slice reveals a channel feature. Using tuning frequencies can estimate thickness and we can obtain detailed depositional data and incorporate it into models for reservoir studies. Here we have the formula for two commonly used transforms used to describe seismic data in terms of frequency components. They are the Fourier transform, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, and the continuous wavelet transform. They look complicated, but the formulae are the same, essentially. They consist of the input function, xt, circled in red here, and a waveform or wavelet in blue. The Fourier transform uses a cosine and sine wave, which are continuous functions and constant time window, while a continuous wavelet transform uses a variable length wavelet, a large window for low frequencies and a short window for high frequencies. Because the Fourier transform uses a fixed window length, it is limited in the vertical resolution of high frequency events, or if the window is smaller, the low frequency information is lost. So there is a trade-off between vertical resolution and positioning and frequency content. The continuous wavelet transform, on the other hand, uses a sliding window length and appropriate for, for the frequency being analysed. Which is better? My preference is to start with the continuous wavelet transform, but check the Fourier transform result. Sometimes it is better. There are other methods such as matching pursuit, but I don't want to go into them today. A common question is, should the input data be in the time or the depth domain? Theoretically, the seismic should be in the time domain because the wavelet is stationary, or at least we try it to be, for it to be. But in the depth domain, the wavelet can be distorted by changes in velocity. But most software companies have allowed depth data to be used as input after user pressure because most of the deliverables today are in the depth domain. In practice, it doesn't matter which time or depth, but I find that the time domain is easier to explain some of the concepts. So how does it work? Well, I'll show you here. We should all be familiar with thin bed tuning, which is shown in the bottom left above, which occurs when the side lobe from a reflection from the bottom of a bed aligns with the peak of the reflection from the top of the bed. Note that the polarity flips when the acoustic impedance below the reflector is less than the acoustic impedance above. The two reflections constructively interfere when the bed is a quarter of a wavelength thick 
or half a wavelength to a time. This tuning results in the highest amplitude reflection when bed thickness is a quarter wavelength as shown by the tuning curve on the middle right. For different frequencies, the wavelength varies and information about different thicknesses can be obtained. Here is a table of tuning thickness calculated for various frequencies and velocities. I find a table like this to be handy to have available. It saves calculating in my head. The table also highlights the diminished information as frequency gets higher. There is very little extra information over the 60 plus hertz range. For this reason, I like to use components about an octave apart to maximize information on blended RGB displays, say 10, 20, or 40 hertz, and or 15, 30, 60 hertz. Now I'm going to show some models to give some insight into how we use spectral decomposition to calculate thickness. Rather than calculating a whole series of frequency volumes, we can calculate the transforms at a single trace, perhaps at a well location and then display the amplitude spectrum at each time sample as color on a time versus frequency display. These plots have two-way time on the vertical scale and frequency on the horizontal axis. The first model is a 10 millisecond thick sand from 90 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds. In depth, this would be 11 meters thick. The highest amplitude along the horizon would indicate the tuning thickness. In these cases, it is the red colored part of the spectrum. Here, the amplitude peak is at 45 hertz. The long window Fourier transform correctly estimates the tuning frequency of 45 hertz, but because the window size is long, the vertical placement of the bed has a large uncertainty, as you can see on the left here. The short window Fourier transform places the top of the layer correctly, but has lost the low frequency information because the window is too short. The continuous wavelet transform result is the best with a more compact amplitude anomaly that defines the tuning peak in tone and frequency. This is the most common use of spectral decomposition, where a single sand or bed is present in a background geology. But what happens when geology is stacked beds? How do we interpret this spectral decomposition response? Next, we can extend the model to include two sands say 10 milliseconds thick and separated by 10 milliseconds. The gross thickness is 30 milliseconds or 33 meters. As expected, there is a peak in amplitude at 45 hertz, which is the tuning frequency of the 10 millisecond layers. But there is also a peak at 17 hertz, labeled E, which corresponds to 32 meters or the gross thickness. Here the FFT looks similar to the continuous wave of transform, or even better. I put this down to the seismic response, which now looks more like a continuous function as seen on the synthetic trace on the right. We can extend this even further with, with this much more complicated model, consisting of four five millisecond sands with five milliseconds between each. The gross interval is 35 milliseconds. Note the change in scale will increase the frequency direction. There are now tuning peaks all over the place. This is much more complex than the two layer model, even though the net sand and gross interval are similar. Spectral decomposition has responded to the layering with several combinations possible that involve the top of a bed and the bottom of a bed, but not necessarily the same bed. As a result, we see peaks corresponding to 5, 15, 25, and 35 meters, shown in the red, green, and blue arrows. And the 5 meter sands are in the yellow, obviously. All these combinations are represented on the two way time versus frequency plot. Well, it now appears that the long window Fourier transform is better than the continuous wavelength transform. In this case, the fast Fourier transform is a better choice. 
Why? I think the answer lies in the synthetic trace on the far right. The seismic is now more similar to the wavelet of the fast Fourier transform than the continuous wavelet transform Mexican hat. Well, that's about half, halfway through now, so I'll take a quick break. So how accurate are these predictions? The typical result is shown here, with estimated fitness plotted against actual fitness in an oil reservoir off Australia's northwest shelf. Errors are in the range 0 to 5 metres, so the predictions are quite accurate. The blue line indicates the estimate that actual fitnesses are equal. Now I will take a look at the effect of the wavelet. Here is an example of several frequency slices across a prospect. It's a triangular shaped prospect in the middle of the uh, area. Scanning across the frequencies, we find the prospect is brightest in the 16 to 20 meter range. Is this the true thickness or is it the bright amplitude at 30 to 40 hertz caused by the wavelet having a peak frequency in this range? It is possible to minimise any wavelet effect by scaling the, dis the displays. It may be hard to see, but these slices are also annotated with the estimated thickness as well as the frequency. This assumes a velocity but makes discussions about thickness more understandable in uh, team air settings. This example shows a single layer model on the left which has only a single reflection and therefore no tuning. It shows the spectrum of the wavelet. The peak amplitude is similar to the 10 meter bed model which is in the top right and could be confusing. It is difficult to separate the effects of the wavelet from the spectral decomposition results, but we could remove the wavelet effect by widening the data. This can be done by normalizing each frequency by making the average value or RMS value or perhaps maximum value of each trace the same. This will boost the high and low frequency parts of the spectrum as shown by the arrow on the bottom left there. Let's see what happens when we try this. On this display, the raw frequency slices are displayed at the top with black outlines and the normalized data is below in the blues outlines. Frequency decreases from left to right. The raw data shows a frequency anomaly at 42 hertz in the top left. The anomaly decreases as frequency decreases with very little amplitude less than 20 hertz in the top right. The normalized data has an amplitude anomaly that persists through the whole frequency range, but it is subtly tuning at 42 to 33 hertz, which is the middle left. Before I go on to the examples, I will show you how to create the time frequency displays in Open Detect. First, Select Attributes in the Analysis tab. Then select Spectral Decon and choose your input data and parameters. Click on the Time Frequency Panel button and finally enter the Trace Location. That's it. The two-way time versus frequency panel is displayed and you can adjust the um, colors or zoom in on various areas. Now it's time to look at some examples. This first example is from the Northwest Shelf of Australia. The small area shown here has 10 wells drilled down with only two dry holes in the southeast and southwest corners. The high amplitude yellow areas are likely to be gas. It is difficult to see any depositional features or trends, although there's plenty of faulting trending northeast to southwest. Can you see anything of interest? perhaps a sandfield channel. After spectral decomposition, a channel can be identified on the 10 Hz component, shown in red on the left. The channel crosses the centre of the survey area from south to north with no breaks across faults. I will highlight the channel in white. Even when you know where the channel is, it's well hidden on the normal seismic display. 
On the right, the RGB display gives an indication of continuity within the channel. RGB displays are useful for viewing multiple attributes on the same map, where the three components of frequency combine to give a white colour. All three components are contributing bit and fin beds are present. To the north, the colour becomes purple, indicating that mid thickness beds have less influence, and yellow, where fin beds are missing. RGB is a blended display with different attributes in the red, blue, and green channels. Let's take a look at a well that intersects the channel. Well number one intersected a 15 meter upper sand above a 60 meter lower sand separated by a 20 meter shale. Both were hydrocarbon saturated. The RGB display on the right shows the white color at the well location, indicating that there is even representation of thick, thin, and medium sized beds. A two-way time versus frequency plot at the well location peaks at about 45 hertz, and at for 2400 meters per second, this gives a wavelength of 53 meters and a tuning thickness of 13 meters. There does not appear to be low frequency information at 10 to 12 hertz, where the 60 meter sand is expected. Where is the fixed sand response? The gamma log is quite uniform, but on the sonic log. There is much more variability, and that explains the strong peak frequency between 45 and 60 hertz. It's, it appears that the fixed sands are actually made of thinner sands of 15 to 12 meters. Sorry about the color on this one, it's a bit gross. And just for completeness, there's the logs for well number two in the northern part of this prospect area. This next example is a simple workflow to obtain estimates of gross rock volume or potential resources in a prospect. Here we have a strong amplitude anomaly and a seismic section through the amplitudes. On the right are sections of 15 hertz, 25, 20 hertz and 50 hertz. Because the reservoir is thinning, the southern edge of the amplitude anomaly moves southwards as frequency increases. If we have a map view of each frequency component, it is simply a matter of drawing a polygon around the high amplitude and assuming a thickness based on the tuning thickness. This will give us an area that we can use for volume calculations. So I've done that. I've traced around the outside lines of the anomalous high amplitudes and the result is a contour map. We can use the contours to generate slice volumes and check how it fits into the prospect inventory. Here's the tabulated results of the aerial calculations. I'll let you work out if this is an economic gas column. Cheers. So what have we learned? Well, a few things. I hope you picked up some tips, but main points. Time or depth data can be used as input. It doesn't really matter which. Spectral decomposition can highlight depositional features not obvious on normal seismic. And I think we both we all knew that. Bed thickness can be predicted using spectral decomposition. Continuous wavelength transforms have better vertical resolution than fast Fourier transforms. The fast Fourier transform is limited by using a fixed window length, which controls the lowest useful frequency. And frequency time displays are handy for predicting the thickness of layers and can give some insight into geological complexity. And finally, RGB displays are useful for viewing multiple frequency content simultaneously. I hope you've picked up some tips, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks.